In this video, I'm going to start our discussion on stereochemistry. And if that's the only reason you're here, then you can skip to the time shown on the screen. But I wanted to quick talk about first something I forgot to talk about in my previous video on asses and bases. And that is inductive effects, which can also affect the strength of asses and bases. And so this has to do with having with having more or less electronegative atoms bound to your molecule. And so we can see here with the methanol, which has a pKa of 15.5, then this trifluoromethanol. And so this has a pKa, or at least one source I found says that it has a pKa of 6.4. Uh, I'm a little bit dubious of this exact number and so if you know anything more about it then you can feel free to let me know in the comments but the the point is that the pKa for trifluoromethanol is lower than the pKa for just methanol and that's because trifluoromethanol has these three uh, highly electronegative atoms on it and so what they're doing is pulling some of the electron density away from that oxygen. And so that makes it more likely to lose that hydrogen because when we are in the conjugate base form, so that is when we have something that looks like this. So we draw these on here. And I think you can see why I like using these diagrams rather than drawing everything out. And so then we have this oxygen with a negative charge on it. And so that negative charge is stabilized by having some of that electron density pulled away from the oxygen by these highly electronegative fluorine atoms. Because in reality, the sort of the electrons in a molecule are kind of somewhat delocalized throughout the entire molecule. And so that that electron cloud, that, you know, quantum mechanical effect of electrons, that electron cloud can sort of get pulled away from the oxygen to help stabilize it. And so we can also see this down here. So these pKa's I'm a little bit more sure of uh, because you find these ones around in more sources than just this one here that I found for this one. But ethanol has a pKa of 16, so that's the pKa of pulling off this hydrogen. Then if we have 222-trifluoroethanol, two, 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 so we have these three fluorines on it, which are pulling some of that electron density, uh, the pKa of losing this hydrogen now goes down to 12. And so remember with pKa, the lower the number, the stronger the acid. But then if we look at isopropanol, uh, now we have these carbons bound to it and so these don't have any different electronegativity than this carbon. So the oxygen is able to is able to draw more electron uh, density towards it because there are more there. Uh, I mean, there's more electron density to be pulled now that we have these extra uh, carbons on here. And so this actually destabilizes the oxygen because we are now pulling more of that negative charge toward the oxygen and so our pKa actually goes up and so that's a weaker acid. Uh, and so that is, as I said, the, uh, the inductive effects for acids and bases. So now we will get to the stereochemistry and so the sort of, I guess, definition of stereochemistry is that we have molecules that have the same number of atoms and the same number of bonds, but they are oriented different in space. And so I showed this in an earlier video, this figure here. So uh, when we're talking about stereochemistry, we're talking about isomers. And so isomers are are well, they are things that satisfy this definition. They have the same number of atoms, the same number of bonds, but they are oriented different in space. And so uh, we have constitutional isomers, which actually have the bonds on things to different uh, carbons or the 
the atoms are bound to different other atoms. So here we have this fluorine bound to this primary carbon here, where here we have this fluorine bound to this secondary carbon here. Uh, but these both have the same number of hydrogens, the same number of carbons, the same number of fluorines, but they are bound to different atoms. So the way the atoms are bound is actually changed around. And then if we go to what are called stereoisomers, which is going to be the topic of this in the next few videos, we are talking about uh, sort of spatial isomers. And so all of the atoms are bound to the same atoms in the different isomers, but they are oriented different in space. So one of the main ones we're going to be talking about in these videos are in antiomers, uh, which are mirror images of each other. But we will also discuss uh, diastereomers, and we've already run into some of these. So the cis-trans isomers, for instance, uh, then with these Newman projections, the different conformers or rotomers, uh, which I've talked about already in previous videos, but I'll discuss a little bit more in the, this in the next few videos as well. Uh, but this video is going to be focused uh, on enantiomers here. And so... Uh, and, and antiomers are mirror image molecules, and so a molecule can be chiral, uh, and so uh, a chiral molecule, so chiral being Greek for handed, and we'll see here that uh, using the hands is a, a good sort of uh, metaphor for the chirality of molecules. And so chiral centers are atoms with bonds that do not allow for superimposition with their mirror image. And we will show that here in a little bit. Uh, but I just wanted to go through this. So all physical things have a mirror image, but a chiral object has a mirror image that is different, that is a different object from itself. So in chemistry, a chiral molecule and its mirror image are called enantiomers, which is what I mentioned before. So enantiomers are mirror image isomers. So they are pairs of compounds that are non-superimposable mirror images. So enantiomers describes the relationship of two chiral molecules. So the idea here being that a, a single molecule can be chiral, but the a pair of chiral molecules that are mirror images of each other are called enantiomers. And so enantiomers describes the relationship of two chiral molecules. So chiral means uh, that something is different from its mirror image. Uh, in other words, it has an enantiomer. So again, a single molecule is chiral. Uh, we can also have achiral, so it's identical to its mirror image under rotations in the requisite number of dimensions. And so this just means not chiral. So it's, again, a single molecule can be achiral. A single molecule is can be chiral. And some, a molecule that is chiral has a mirror image that is the enantiomer of that chiral molecule. And so hands are chiral objects, and that's because they're mirror image. So your left hand and your right hand, there is no way you can sort of reorient it by sort of twisting it or rotating it around in three dimensions that would allow them to superimpose on each other. So if you do this, you're always going to have, you know, the thumbs pointed in different directions. If you try to turn one of the hands so that, like, the thumbs are together, uh, then, you know, the back of the hands are going to be facing away from each other, so they're still not superimposable. And so this is why, I mean, this is why the word chiral, which, remember, is Greek for handedness, is used, because the hands are a really good representation of objects that are chiral. Whereas if we have something like this flask here, these are achiral, because if we take the mirror image of it, we can superimpose them on each other. And this would be the case even if we put, like, a handle on this. So if we just put like a handle on there so that its handle is like that, then we would just have to sort of, uh, after we take the mirror image, we just have to rotate one of these around by 180 degrees and then they would be superimposable. And so that's why I said up here that things that are achiral are uh, identical to their mirror image 
under rotations. So if you can rotate it in some way to get it to superimpose on each other, then they are achiral. If you cannot do that, then they are chiral. Uh, and again, so if we want to be more precise, that's in three dimensions. If you moved up to four dimensions, it would be possible to rotate in four dimensions to get a left hand to superimpose on a right hand. But we, you know, we live in a three dimension, three spatial dimensional world, so we are interested in three dimensions here. And so kind of bringing this to molecules, so uh, you'll often see a figure that looks like this. I got this from Wikipedia. And so we can see that these hands are chiral and the, then the molecules that are sort of being held in the hands are chiral because if you took this molecule here and tried to rotate it around in space, any way you rotate it, it would not be able to superimpose with that molecule right there. Even though they have the same atoms with the same bonds uh, going when the same bonds between the same atoms they are non superimposable because they are mirror images of each other that cannot be superimposed and so uh, the thalidomide is often used as an example of this in molecules and so thalidomide was a medication that was supposed to help with uh, with I think morning sickness back in the day and so it was given uh, with both of the enantiomers present in it. So we see this one has this wedge here, so it's coming out of the screen where this has the dashes here, so it's going into the screen. Uh, we will discuss uh, later, uh, probably, well, in this video, this R and S, what that means, but that's just uh, sort of distinguishing between the two chiral centers, which is what this atom is right here, and this atom is right here. Those are atoms are called chiral centers because that's where the chirality is occurring. But uh, this this is usually shown as uh, you know a way to demonstrate that these molecules, even though they are sort of exactly the same in their bonds and the number of atoms and everything, having these different uh, structures, these different three-dimensional structures because they're mirror images can be very uh, important because with this, so we have the the R in antihumor here, which causes the desired sedative effect, but then the other in antihumor causes birth defects. So as I said, this was used to help treat morning sickness, and so it was pregnant women taking this, but they were taking it, and this this in antihumor here, this S in antihumor was causing birth defects and so the fact that these things are almost exactly the same except that they are non-superimposable mirror images on each other has very important effects on these molecules as we will be discussing throughout these videos and so it's not a trivial thing to have these enantiomers here to to just sort of say well you know if we just have a mixture of them what's the big deal they're pretty much exactly the same so that the it is important that we have these these enantiomers here to have to distinguish between the enantiomers here all right so we are looking at these, so we are looking at these mirror images of each other. So what we have on the left here, we're looking at these two mirror images. These are the same compound, and so they are achiral. And so we can see this is exactly the same as this. And so, you know, we wouldn't even have to rotate them to be able to get them to superimpose, where these are different compounds. So again, they have all, they have the same number of atoms, the same number of bonds, all of the atoms are bound to the same other atoms. They are just oriented different in space, but because this has the chlorine down here and this up here, and this has it up here and this down here, they are different compounds. So there is no way to rotate one of these things around in space such that you could get them to superimpose on each other. And so they are considered different compounds. So, you know, they're not just the same compound, but, you know, with this weird little quirky difference, they are actually different compounds. Uh, and so 
on here we're just calling it trans 1 2 dichlorocyclopentane but as we'll see later in this video we do actually have naming conventions for differentiating them and that is that R and S naming convention and so uh, this name here doesn't have that in there but when we are naming these two different compounds as we'll see we do have to have that R and S in there to distinguish that these are two different compounds. Uh, so this is just another example here so these are the same compounds and so sort of a hallmark of seeing that these are the same compounds is that two of these substituents are the same thing. So those are both methyl groups. These are both methyl groups. And so uh, we have this mirror image. If we just turn this one around by 120 degrees, we could superimpose it on this one here where these are different compounds. So what you'll see is the only thing that I changed on here is I changed one of these methyl groups into an ethyl group. And so now we take the mirror image, even if we turn this by 120 degrees to get this ethyl group to superimpose with that ethyl group, we then have this methyl group superimposing on this hydrogen or uh, failing to superimpose, I guess, uh, would be more accurate. Uh, and so those are not the same compound because there's no way we could rotate those around to get them to superimpose on each other. And, you know, again, just sort of driving this point home. So we have achiral, so this has two bromines bound to it. And so that's achiral because if we take the mirror image of it, so we have this, we go from this to this, uh, we take the mirror image, we could just rotate this around uh, a certain amount to get those, that to superimpose on itself. Uh, and in fact, it'd probably actually be easier to rotate it this direction, 120 degrees, to get those to superimpose on each other. Uh, and then so uh, over here, we have the chiral. And I guess the thing I wanted to show on here is that when we are looking at sort of the central atom on these, we call this the chiral center. So I've already sort of used that terminology before. So we call it the chiral center. And uh, you will often see that denoted with this star or asterisk here. So putting an asterisk on the chiral center. So again, if we take the mirror image of this, you see that we can no longer superimpose one on the other. Uh, so this is sort of another thing here. So these are achiral molecules. Uh, so, but these are actually these diastereomers or a, a certain kind of diastereomer. And so we call these carbons stereocenters. So not chiral centers, but stereocenters. So we see that if we took the mirror image of this trans one here, we'd end up with something that has, uh, that has the carbons that look like this. We have the bromine down here and that bromine up there, that H there, that H there. But I could just rotate this, uh, I could just rotate this uh, sort of 180 degrees around that and we would just get back the same thing we had. So these, uh, these are achiral, so these do not have chiral uh, centers on them. Th these are just called stereo centers on them. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in uh, a, a future video in this uh, series, which will probably take about this video plus two other ones after it. Uh, but anyway, so some rules of thumb for chirality, and I have this one boxed because this is sort of the only hard and fast rule here. So if a compound has no asymmetric carbon in it, uh, then it is usually achiral, and, uh, but as we'll see, there are important exceptions. So the hard and fast one, if a compound has just one asymmetric carbon, so uh, one chiral center, then it must be chiral. So having one chiral center means that, the, that it must be a chiral molecule, meaning that it has an enantiomer. So it has a mirror image that is the enantiomer. If a compound has more than one 
chiral center or asymmetric carbon. It may or may not be chiral. And so we will explore that uh, quite a bit more in uh, the next couple videos after this one. And so if we have an internal mirror plane, so any molecule that has an internal mirror plane of symmetry cannot be chiral, even though it may contain asymmetric carbons. And so we have this one here, which we already kind of saw, but we see this has an internal mirror plane. And so uh, if we reflect this molecule across this, we just get the exact same molecule back. Uh, but what we see is that this carbon here is in fact chiral, and this carbon here is in fact chiral. But even though those two molecules are chiral centers, uh, we have two of them in this entire molecule. This full molecule has this internal mirror plane. The molecule itself is not a chiral molecule. Uh, because as we saw before, if we take the mirror image of it across here, if we take the mirror image of the entire thing, uh, we get back just the the uh, same molecule. So we have our CLs right here and our H's right there. And so the molecule itself is not chiral, even though it has chiral centers on it. Uh, but if a molecule does not contain an internal mirror plane of symmetry, it is not necessarily chiral. Uh, but this one here is in fact chiral. It has it has no mirror plane of symmetry. If we reflect across this mirror plane here, we will get a different molecule. So uh, we would get you know something that looks like uh, that looks like this. So if we reflect it across there, we now have that Cl there, and that H there, uh, that Cl there, and that H there. So that is a chiral molecule, but we can look at this right here. So this does not contain any mirror planes of symmetry, uh, but it is a it, and, uh, it is not a chiral molecule rather. So these are the same compound. So this does not contain any mirror planes of symmetry. So we there's no mirror plane like this because these ones are pointing out of the screen, and this one into the screen. There's no mirror plane like this because this is bromine, and this is chlorine, but these are the same compound. So if we take the mirror image of the, the molecule, we get this, but with this, we could just uh, we could just flip this around. So we could just sort of rotate it around that way, and we would just end up getting this same molecule back here. And so even though it does not contain an internal mirror plane of symmetry. So it does not contain an internal mirror plane of symmetry. It could still be uh, achiral. So not having that mirror plane does not necessarily mean chiral. But anything that does have an internal mirror plane of symmetry uh, cannot be chiral. And so this is kind of the hard and fast rule right here. So having an internal mirror plane of symmetry uh, means that it cannot be uh, that it cannot be chiral. All right, so we will get to the R and S nomenclature that I sort of hinted at before. And so I already talked about these uh, Kahn Ingold prelog conventions in a previous video, but I'll go through them in a bit more detail here. And so we want to assign priority to the atoms bound to the chiral center. And so the, the way that we do this, so the first rule here is that atoms with higher atomic numbers have higher priority. And so iodine has a higher atomic number than bromine, so it's a higher priority. Bromine is higher than chlorine, so that's a higher priority, and so on down the list until we get to hydrogen, which has the lowest atomic number, and so it has the lowest priority. Uh, this rule here is one we probably won't really run into, uh, but atoms with a higher isotope also have a higher priority. And so if the bonded atoms, so the atoms bound to the chiral center, have the same priority, then we looked to the next atom bound to it. And so for instance, uh, if we have this right here, uh, so 
this carbon here and this carbon here are bound to our our chiral center so we can't tell just between those which one is the higher priority so we look to the uh, atoms bound to those carbons. This one has a carbon bound to it, where this only has hydrogens bound to it. And so this, ha uh, this group has the higher priority. Uh, but if we have this ethyl group here, uh, then we have one that has a chlorine bound to it, where the chlorine is the higher atomic number, then this one right here will be the higher priority. Uh, but then if we, uh, so if we're looking at this one with a chlorine bound, and but then we have one that has a bromine bound, where the bromine is the higher priority, uh, then this group here will be the higher priority. Uh, so we could look at a few more examples of that. So this was our uh, carbon to bromine, higher priority than our carbon to chlorine, which is a higher priority than our uh, than this carbon to carbon. Well, this has three carbons bound to it here. Uh, then this has the uh, bromine uh, bound to this carbon, uh, but the bromine is bound further down here, and so this is lower priority. So on this one, we go carbon uh, to carbon, carbon, and carbon, so it has three carbons. This goes to carbon to carbon and carbon, and then this just has a hydrogen here. So even though it has this bromine here, that's uh, like one further removed from it, and so this one has the higher priority than this because it has three carbons bound rather than just two carbons bound to this first carbon right here. Uh, then this uh, only has one carbon bound to it, but we see this goes to more carbons down the line. But since it has two hydrogens uh, and only one carbon bound to it, this one with the two carbons bound to it is going to be higher priority. Uh, and so this is sort of illustrating that. So we have this with the three carbons bound, which is higher priority than one with two carbons bound, which is higher priority than one with one carbon bound, which is higher priority than one which with has only hydrogens on it. And then uh, if we go to chain length, so one with uh, one, two, three, four carbons bound uh, has a higher priority than uh, a chain that's only uh, well, that has three carbons bound to this one right here, which is higher priority than one that has two carbons bound to this one right here, which is higher priority than one that only has one carbon bound to this one right here, which would be higher priority than one that only has uh, hydrogens on it. And so the the main point here being that if if the carbons or the the atoms bound to our our chiral carbon are sort of in a tie, then we just go down the line to the next carbon uh, or the next atom bound to it and look at the priority of that. Uh, and if that's a tie, then we just sort of go down to the next one after that to look at priority and so on and so forth. All right, then the uh, double and triple bonds is a little bit trickier than those rules. Uh, and so what we do is we essentially look at this. So if we have a double bond here, we essentially look at it like this. So we have this carbon bound to this carbon, but then we have this double bond. So we sort of put on an imaginary other carbon here. So what I have circled in red, because being double bound to one carbon is uh, sort of equivalent to being bound, being singly bound to two carbons. Uh, and similar for this carbon here, it's double bound to that carbon there. And so that's sort of being the same as being singly bound to two carbons. So it's singly bound to that carbon, but it's also singly bound to this sort of imaginary carbon right here. And so we sort of uh, count the priority on it as if we have something that looks like this. And so remember I was saying before, so if we had this uh, this right here bound to a single carbon, so if we compare that to, so if we have that like this, uh, so even if we have a carbon going there, and then an H there, and an H there, 
then an H there, and an H there. So instead of having this sort of imaginary carbon there, we now have this hydrogen. Uh, this right here is going to be the higher priority because we are looking at this carbon here. And this one is only bound to one other carbon where this is sort of uh, equivalent to bound to two other carbons. Uh, then if we go to a triple bond, then we uh, are looking at it so as if this carbon right here is bound to three other carbons. So it's bound to the, so we're looking at it as if it's singly bound to the actual other carbon it's bound to. But then it's uh, bound singly bound to these imaginary carbons here. And same for that carbon there. Uh, it's as if we are, so we're actually bound to that carbon, but then we're sort of imaginarily uh, singly bound to those carbons right there. And so we, uh, we get the priority based on that. And we can do the same thing if we are double bound to other things, such as an oxygen. So this carbon right here is bound to that oxygen and it's doubly bound to that oxygen so it's as if it's bound to one two three other oxygens where this oxygen right here is double bound to that carbon so we have a bond going to that carbon and one going to that imaginary carbon right there and so this is how we would count that uh, that priority on it uh, and so, yeah, this is how we treat the double and triple bonds. Um, I think maybe sort of a rule of thumb is uh, if we have a double bond uh, sort of close, closer to our, our chiral carbon, then that often takes priority because it is acting as if it's sort of bound to sort of more things going on than if we have just a single bond to it. So uh, I guess if we wanted to compare this to, so we have our R group there, we have C going to OH. And so if this was uh, just going to another OH here, and then this was down to an H, this would be a higher priority, this one right here, because it's like our carbon is bound to three oxygens rather than two. Uh, and even if we said that this wasn't a hydrogen, even if we said this was a, a carbon down here, since oxygens have a uh, higher atomic number than carbons, so if this was down to like a CH3 here, this would still be uh, the higher priority because it's bound, it's as if this carbon here is bound to three oxygens rather than two oxygens and a carbon. So. That's what you often see is that these double and triple bonds sort of uh, take these higher priorities on here. All right, so when we so we have our priority rules, and so now how do we actually apply these priority rules? And so we are looking at this these molecules right here, and so these are chiral molecules, and these two things are enantiomers of each other. So uh, if we put like a mirror right there, uh, this this one right here is the mirror image of this one right here. And so what you want to do essentially is you want to sort of rotate these around in space so that you get the lowest priority on here, which uh, if you have a hydrogen is going to be your hydrogen, so that that is pointing back into the screen. So if we rotate this around, we're sort of flipping this chlorine up here, uh, which is going to sort of, uh, you know, rotate this around here, and it's going to sort of rotate this down here so that we end up with it looking like this. So this is supposed to have that hydrogen sort of pointing into the screen. And so all these three things are somewhat pointing out of the screen. And then so we want to assign our priorities here. And so we, uh, so this is the first priority because this bromine is the highest atomic, uh, has the highest atomic number. This chlorine has the second highest atomic number. So it has a two priority. Then this carbon right here is the third priority. And then so what we do is we start from one and rotate around in the direction up from higher to lower priority. And so what we see here, this is uh, rotating 
counterclockwise. And so when we, ha when we rotate counterclockwise around the priorities, we call that the S enantiomer. So this is the S enantiomer. And so we do the same thing on this one. So we sort of rotate it so that the hydrogen is in the back. So we have this pointing sort of backwards like that. And so now our priorities are going to be in the opposite direction. And so if we go from one to two to three, uh, we are rotating clockwise. And so we get the R enantiomer. And so uh, if you're one of those people who don't like to think in counterclockwise and clockwise, you could think of R. So on the top, it's going right. So R equals uh, equals right. So it's sort of the righty tighty lefty loosey thing. And so R just equals right uh, when we are rotating around those priorities there. Uh, and I mean, in a couple of videos, we'll see why, uh, you know, using that isn't always the best when we get to the Fisher projections. But uh, for our purposes now, if you want to think about it that way, you can think about it that way. Because you can, you can always do this, even when we're using our Fisher projections, uh, which I'm not going to get into too much here. But you can always sort of, especially if you have like a molecular modeling kit, which if you're not good at sort of manipulating 3D things in your head. Getting a molecular model kit uh, is always a good idea. There, but you can always uh, sort of manipulate it around so that you have the lowest priority sort of pointing away from you. Uh, and then get the, and then be able to prioritize the things sort of facing you. And then the R and N tumor, you can always get it so that you're doing sort of the righty tighty thing in the S being the lefty Lucy. All right, and here is just another uh, example of it. So now we have our nitrogen here, which is the highest atomic number. So that gets first. This carbon here is bound to these oxygens, so that will have second uh, compared to this one, which only which is only a carbon bound to hydrogens. So that gets third. So we go. Uh, we go around this counterclockwise, we get the S enantiomer. Uh, this one, we go around clockwise, and so we get the R enantiomer. So this being our first priority, this being second, because our carbon is now bound to oxygen, where this is third, because our carbon is only bound to hydrogens on there. And so here are sort of my rules of thumb on here. So if we have just singly bonded hydrocarbon chains on it, then the longer the singly bonded hydrocarbon chain, the higher the priority. Uh, so the next one here, the first substituent to reach a double carbon bond takes priority over any sized singly bonded hydrocarbon chain. And the reason for that is because, you know, if we have like something that is, you know, a very long hydrocarbon chain compared to something that's even just a short hydrocarbon chain, but is there. So here is our R group. Uh, we get to this carbon here, and this is bound to two other carbons where on this, we get to this, and this is only bound to two hydrogens on it. So even if we end up with like a really long hydrocarbon chain on there, uh, if we get to this, which uh, remember this is sort of uh, is sort of uh, somewhat equivalent to that. So even if we get to this double bond first, uh, even if this is on a shorter hydrocarbon chain than this, uh, then this will take priority. So this group will take priority over even this very long hydrocarbon chain. So the first substituent to reach a double carbon carbon bond takes priority over any sized singly bonded hydrocarbon chain. All right, so the first substituent to reach an atom with a higher atomic number than carbon takes priority over double bonded hydrocarbons. So what I mean by that, so we have our R group here. Uh, if we go here and now we go to CL, so you know this could go on to whatever going on there. Uh, but we have this R group here, this goes to that, we go down here, and now we have our, our double bond going on there. 
well, this double bond is on this carbon where this uh, higher priority substituent comes off of that carbon. And so this carbon takes priority over that carbon. And so the first substituent to reach an atom with a higher atomic number than carbon takes priority over double bonded hydrocarbons. Then the next one is a carbon with more substituents of equal priority takes priority over carbons with fewer substituents of equal priority. So looking at the first atom of the substituent bound to the carbon. And so this uh, here is sort of, uh, sort of demonstrating that where we have, so I'll start over here at the lowest priority. So this is just a carbon bound to hydrogens, which is lower priority than this carbon, which is bound to two hydrogens, and then another carbon, which is lower priority than this carbon, which is bound to this carbon, which is bound to another carbon. Then we get to this, where we have this double bond here, uh, which is even higher priority and so this right here is like this one down here if we put our sort of imaginary carbons on it. And so that's why we have these uh, more substituents on here. So this one right here, we have this carbon, which is equivalent to that one. Then we go to this one, which is equivalent to that. But then this is bound to only one other carbon, which is, but this one is bound to two other carbons uh, if we include this imaginary one right here. But then this will take priority over that because now we have this carbon bound to a, a uh, higher atomic number atom right there. But then this one, this one is bound to an even higher atomic number than this one, and so this takes priority. This one is bound to an even higher atomic number than this oxygen, so this takes priority. This one is bound to two fluorines rather than just one, and so it takes priority over that one. Uh, we could even uh, we could even you know add in the the uh, C H H to C F three, which would take priority. It would take priority over this one, but this one here would take priority over this because the Cl bound to it, which is a higher atomic number than the fluorine. Uh, then, but then if we get to this one, so we now have this C here, which is equivalent to that, but now we have another C coming off of this one here, and so it takes priority over that carbon right there. So that is sort of the way that these priorities will, uh, will occur on here. All right, so now we can look at this, and so we can try to guess what the uh, what the R or S designation of this is going to be. And so we already kind of have this H sort of pointing back, and so what we want to do is uh, try to assign priorities on here. And so what we have is this carbon bound to, so we're looking at this carbon. This is our chiral center right here. So we're looking at this carbon bound to it, this carbon bound to it, this carbon bound to it. So which of those takes priority? Well, well, this one takes priority here, so we'll call that one because it is to, uh, bound, it is double bound to this carbon right here. Uh, where these ones are only singly bound to their next carbon. And so uh, this one will take priority over those two. But now we want to look at these two carbons here. And so we want to look at their next carbon. Well, their next carbon on here, this one is double bound to a carbon. This one is double bound to an oxygen. And so this, is, this carbon right here is going to be the second priority because its next carbon is double bound to an oxygen. This one is lowest priority because its next carbon is only doubly bound to a carbon. And so it looks like we, if we are going from one to two to three, we are going around this way. And so that's counterclockwise. And so this looks like it is probably an S. So I have the answer down here. And so, yep, in fact, this is S. Uh, and so this is the S 
carvone uh, molecule here. And so again, this uh, asterisk here is on our our uh, chiral carbon right there. And so if we look at our first substituent, if we sort of split that double bond so that we end up with this, uh, this car first carbon coming off of it is as if it is bound to three other carbons, where on the second one, this is bound to only one other carbon and then two hydrogens. Same as on the third, this is only bound to one other carbon and then two hydrogens. And so now on this, these two here, so just looking at these two here, we now need to get the priority for that. So we look at this carbon right here, and we see that this one uh, is now bound to uh, so this carbon would be this one here. Uh, this carbon would be this one here. And so this one is bound to these two oxygens, where this one is only bound to these two carbons here. And so even though uh, this next carbon down is now double bound, bound to this oxygen, uh, it is lower priority because uh, it is only bound to these, uh, well, I guess it's bound to these three carbons, where this one is bound to these two oxygens and then another carbon right there. And so we assign this as S right here. Uh, so, yeah, that is how you do the RS designation. And so, as I said, uh, we need to put these R and S on here in order to distinguish which of the two enantiomers it is. Because, as I pointed out earlier, uh, these enantiomers are important because they can have different effects. They are different molecules. And so, uh, you know, this becomes very important, especially when we are talking about uh, things that like medications, which will have a biological effect. And as I'll point out in uh, like the next couple videos too, that biological molecules are always uh one of the enantiomers over the other. And so uh, like amino acids, sugars, these are all chiral molecules. But in biology, we only use one of the enantiomers for them. And so these different molecules are going to have different effects. Uh, you know, for instance, the thalidomide, where the R1 here causes the desired sedative effect, where the S1 here on the thalidomide causes birth defects. And so these are different molecules, these two enantiomers. And so we have to have different names for them. And so the naming convention we have is this RS naming convention. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't want to ramble on t too long. Uh, this was uh, taking our first look here at enantiomers. In the next video, I'll talk more about enantiomers and sort of uh, how we actually measure them. And so I, I guess kind of unfortunately, we end up having yet another naming convention based on how we measure enantiomers. But uh, but yeah, we'll be talking more about enantiomers in the next video. Uh, the video after that, I'll, I'll continue on with enantiomers, but we'll also talk a bit about diastereomers. Uh, and so, as I said, we already discussed a little bit of the cis-trans isomers in previous videos. We already talked about the, uh, the conformers and rotomers a bit in previous videos using these Newman projections, but I'll go over that a little bit more uh, yet in the coming videos. But anyway, I don't want to ramble on too long. I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.